Thank you, Erica. Hi, everyone. Again, welcome to NT Preview. We are the College of Health and Public Service. And um, again, like Erica said, my name is Rachel Rachel, and I am so glad to be here welcoming you all to um, NT Preview Day. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. I am joined here today by my, my co-workers. Um, we have Parker Ellis. Hello, everybody. Uh, we have Amanda Devaney. Hello. And Xavier Floyd. Good morning. So all of us are here kind of to help uh, answer your questions if you if you happen to have any. Um, I think we also have an attendee from the um, from the um, Department of Public Administration. Um, I think she might have some difficulty getting in if um, if Erica I don't know if you might be able to help with that, but um, anyway, if you're joining us, uh, not live, but if you're watching the pre-recording, I welcome you to this session as well. So um, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm going to begin the slideshow presentation here. So how does that look, you guys? Uh, we cannot see it. Okay. course, technical errors. It worked yesterday, I'm going to say that. <laughs> okay, of course, let's see, let's, um, let's go ahead and um, Parker, why don't we begin the video with the introduction from our yeah. Dean. Um, and we'll in the meantime, I'll get this presentation set up. Get that going. Share a computer sound. There we go. All right, here we go. Welcome to UNT Preview. I'm Dr. Nicole Dash, the new Dean of the College of Health and Public Service, or HPS for short. You've chosen the best college at UNT. Not that I'm biased. You should know that all of our degrees lead to careers where you'll make a difference. I wish I could meet all of you in person, but I assure you that this is the next best thing. You're going to learn a lot in the next hour, but if you have any questions, know that you can reach out at any time for more information. Our college has a lot to be proud of, and we're excited that you want to be part of it. We have seven departments in HPS, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about each. Our Department of Audiology and Speech-Language Pathology has an almost 100% employment rate for graduate students, and our Doctor of Audiology program is ranked fourth in the state by U.S. News & World Report. Our Department of Behavior Analysis is home to the first ABAI accredited behavior analysis program in the nation. Our Department of Criminal Justice's online bachelor's degree program is ranked eighth in the nation by the bestschools.org. Our Department of Emergency Management and Disaster Science is home to the first emergency administration and planning degree in the nation. Our Department of Public Administration master's program is ranked first in Texas and seventh in the nation by U.S. News and World Report, and its alumni fill the majority of city manager jobs in Texas and many in the nation. Our Department of Rehabilitation and Health Services Rehabilitation Counseling Program is ranked number one in Texas and 12th in the nation. And our Department of Social Work houses the first joint Masters of Social Work program in the state with our friends over at TWU. You'll be hearing all about our undergraduate degrees today from some of our excellent faculty, but I also wanted to take a moment to let you know about some of our graduate degrees and programs. You can apply to any one of these after you finish your bachelor's degree. Some of these programs even allow top students to earn graduate credit while you're finishing your undergraduate degrees. Our master's programs are in the following areas, behavior analysis, emergency management and disaster science, health services administration, public administration, criminal justice with a justice policy and administration concentration, criminal justice with a theory and research concentration, rehabilitation counseling, social work, the one with TWU, and speech language pathology. Our doctoral programs are in audiology, health services research, and public administration management. I wanna tell you again how happy we are that you're here 
and we look forward to having you as part of the HPS family. We're always available to answer any of your questions. Just send us an email at hps.unt.edu. Also, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at UNTHPS. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you enjoyed learning more about all our exciting programs. Go Mean Green! I hope you enjoyed that introduction. Um, now, um, Perk, are you able to pull up that presentation for us? Yes. Let me Thank you. Get this going. All right. Is that visible now for you? Yeah, that looks great. And so again, welcome to the College of Health and Public Service. Um, you know, we are strengthening communities through education, scholarship, and engagement. That's our motto. Um, and those are our three prongs of, um, um, you know, <laughs> of our mission, essentially, education, research, and engagement. We have seven departments and nine undergraduate degrees in this college. Um, we have the audiology speech language pathology, that's a Bachelor of Science. Um, with that video that we uh, just showed you the introduction for, um, we have department representatives um, from each from each department um, that give you a little blurb about, um, about why you should choose UNT and why you should choose their particular degree. So um, if you are interested in any one of these um, nine undergraduate degrees um, certainly jot down this timestamp. Um, we do have this video posted on our um, UNT HPS uh, YouTube page so you can check it out there. Um, we have the uh, ASLP degree like I mentioned, we have behavior analysis, we have a criminal justice, emergency administration and planning, nonprofit leadership studies, the public health degree, rehabilitation studies, social work and urban policy and planning. So I do hope that you will take the time to um, to watch that video today um, and let us know if you have any uh, questions about that. So we're just going to go into what what the advisors do and how we can help you from our our side of things. Um, so first of all, we, we, we tell students what, uh, what's required for their degree, right? So the components of a bachelor's degree at UNT for all of our degrees in HPS require um, 120 credit hours. Um, this is a combination of the university core, which are your basics, your English, science, math, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we also have the major component, which is the, um, the area that is your, your you, you know, that matches your area of interest and what you're, um, you know, really hoping to hone in on. Um, we, we may have some college or school requirements such as GPA requirements or requirements in foreign languages. Um, some of our degree programs require a minor, which is sort of like a miniature major. Um, and it's, in some cases, it's optional. Um, and then we have general electives. So anything that uh, does not fit within um, within those other areas uh, is a general elective um, and you can essentially um, take extra classes so that you meet the 120 credit hour requirement. So this is an example of one of our program sheets and planning guides. Um, this is just uh, the criminal justice guide here. Um, on the left side, you'll see the program sheet and it gives you an overview of um, a little blurb at the top about the department um, and a list of uh, career opportunities that you can pursue with this particular degree. Uh, we have underneath that the major requirements and a list of all of the different classes required with their course codes. Um, and then on the flip side, on the right side of the page, um, you'll see the criminal justice planning sheet um, where we divide that by um, the core, which is listed on the left hand side. And the, again, the major requirements on the right. So that sheet on the right shows you all 120 hours required for the degree. Now we have one for each of our majors. And this is something that if you were to email your, um, your academic advisor, you can, you can get one of these. They can look at any transfer credits you might be coming in with or AP credits or dual credits, um, and we can show you how those credits will apply to this particular degree. 
um, and give you an idea of how many hours you'll need left. Um, and we can help you in that transition from um, either high school or community college into UNT, into one of our programs. Uh, I do want to pause here and just let you know we do have the Q&A function today. Uh, so if you do have a question for us, we are standing by and ready to answer your questions. So at any time, you can click the Q&A at the bottom and submit a question for us. We offer scholarships, right? So we offer scholarships university-wide, um, but we also have scholarships that are just for HPS students. We have hundreds that are available. Um, we have the general academic scholarship application, which is due March 1st, um, and that encompasses all UNT um, scholarships. And then you can find our uh, college and departmental scholarships by following this link here. Um, and that's hps.unt dot edu slash scholarships. So it's a good idea to apply early um, so that you can submit your scholarship application in March so that the money and, and financial aid will apply for the following fall and spring uh, semesters. Just want to give you that tip. And so I want to introduce you to um, the, the staff in our office. This is the Director of HPS Advising, Mr. Richard Mabry. Um, the Assistant Dean of Student Success is another, another title of his. Uh, he did just win the Nakata Award for um, um, Advising Director of the Year, and we're, we're super proud of him, and he leads a great team. Um, and, and he is, um, is a wonderful, wonderful leader. So I hope that you all have a chance to um, interface with him. Um, our front office is um, run by Miss Katie Barrett and um, a bear. Sorry, <laughs> Katie a bear. Um, and she takes care of all the behind the scenes uh, stuff going on. She manages our office um, and is the one to uh, be the point person answering um, the emails that will come to um, a, our general college if you're not quite sure who to uh, who to direct a question to. Uh, the audiology and speech language pathology advisor is Dr. Rod Strang. Um, he is, he's great and can answer any of your questions there. Behavior analysis, if this is the degree you're interested in, um, we actually split this major in half. So uh, Mr. Parker Ellis takes last names, uh, students with the last name A through H, and I will advise students with the last name I through Z. Criminal justice is one of our largest majors, so we actually have three advisors uh, assigned to this particular major. Uh, Ms. Amanda Devaney advises for the last names A through F, Brisa Finnegan, last names G through O, and Xavier Floyd, last names P through Z. And for the Emergency Administration and Planning degree, Nonprofit Leadership Studies, and Urban Policy and Planning, I advise for all of those. And again, my name is Rachel. Rachel. Our public health degree is advised by Azama Alia. Oh, and she won Advisor of the Year, so we're super proud of her. She is um, one of the top advisors at UNT, so you would be lucky to be able to uh, be advised by her. Our rehabilitation studies majors are split in half. So Azama Alia advises for last names A through R and Amanda Devaney, last names S through Z. And again, social work is advised by Parker Ellis. So please, please reach out and contact us if you have questions. Um, if you're not sure who the question should be directed to, you can send it to our HPS Advising Services email at unt.edu, or you can uh, reach out to any individual uh, by uh, <laughs> emailing the first name dot last name at unt.edu. So we are here for any questions you might have. Um, we are checking the Q&A box now. So we're on standby while we kind of see if anyone has questions. And I, I have a, a couple uh, 
you know, one thing I can answer real quick that it's a pretty common question that I, I hear um, is what makes our, our majors different in our college versus other colleges. Um, I always kind of like to bring it down to our majors focus on getting you hands on experience as well as what the that's what the fields kind of focus on. Um, so a lot of our courses, especially when you get into the advanced courses uh, in your program may involve any kind of uh, experiential learning where you're going out in the community and helping. Um, for instance, if you're working with the, uh, if you're a behavior analysis student, you're going out and uh, volunteering at community areas with uh, such as like uh, autism centers and so on. So it is very much focused on getting that hands-on experience, making sure you you know what you're getting in, uh, what your career path is gonna be and make sure you you have that kind of hands-on experience to, to uh, make yourself a better uh, candidate for any kind of future uh, career paths. Thank you, Parker. Yeah. Um, we have a great question that was asked. Um, are there any specific requirements for HPS? Um, so uh, unlike some of the other colleges, we um, as, in general do not require a foreign language for all of our students. However, if you are an audiology speech language pathology major, you do require a foreign, we do require foreign languages for those students. Um, but as far as like an, a, a general overview requirement just for HPS, there there is not any specific requirement. Um, it really comes down to what major you're choosing. Now, um, I would like to address something that I know we also get questions about Parker and, and our attendees. Um, and that's, you know, if I want to um, go into med school or, um, you know, go into the medical field in any area, is this, is this a good choice for me? Uh, we do have health in our, in our uh, college title. <laughs> and I think many of our degrees are, are fine options uh, for a bachelor's degree to, to take before going into the, um, you know, into med school. So at the undergraduate level, you've got to get four years under your belt um, and, and do that before, um, before applying to a medical school. So one of our, one of our um, medical related degrees would be just fine. Um, I know many of our students in audiology, speech language pathology might, might choose that route or behavior analysis. Um, public health certainly is our number one option. Um, and I think all of these give uh, wonderful um, options uh, to kind of, in case, I don't know, in case you end up deciding to, to take a different path, but you still want to be in that health-related field, um, these give you an alternative option um, after graduation to pursue something else besides um, a, a medical um, degree. Um, off the top of my head, there's a, there's a question about the accreditation organization associated with, associated with the uh, Bachelor of Science for Public Health program. I actually do not know that off the top of my head. Rachel, do you happen to know or any, any other advisors here? I, I, I don't happen to know that. I know public health is newly acquired in our college. Now, all of, you know, UNT is an accredited institute. Um, however, each individual program may or may not be um, in association with uh, an accredited organization. Um, and, and I just don't know that answer off the top of my head. Um, Azama Aliyah might be able to answer that question if you wanted to send her, send her an email, but um, I, I don't happen to know that right now. Um, Let's see, uh, we have a question of is, is there a grad track for applied behavior analysis? There's not necessarily a grad track, um, but it does get you prepared to go towards a, 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 a master's degree in that in that field. Um, and then if you have if you uh, receive the bachelor's degree in uh, applied behavior analysis, you do have the uh, ability to uh, pursue the BCABA, or they call it the little A, uh, where it's where yeah, it's board certified assistant behavior analysis. Um, but it does lead you towards going towards grad school for the uh, bachelor for a master's degree in behavior analysis, which UNT has two. Uh, we have uh, an arts, uh, Master of Arts and Master of Science program, uh, where one is a traditional program and one is an online program. Um, so you have your options with that, but it does kind of, it does lead you towards that master's degree, but there's no specific grad track for it. Um, 
Yeah, so uh, we have a question about the uh, pre-social work requirements, and I'll kind of take that since that's the, the main area I work with. Um, so for social work at UNT, it's a little bit different than uh, than a lot of other programs. You actually, when you come into UNT, you'd be a pre-social work student, and you'd be working towards the prerequisites of the program, as well as working working through most of your core and electives, not, not necessarily all of it, but most of it. And typically, near the end of your sophomore years, when we have you apply towards the social work program. Uh, once you're in the program, it takes two years for full semesters uh, to complete. Uh, summers don't really accelerate that at all. Um, so a good thing you know is once you're at UNT is a minimum of two and a half years until you graduate if you're coming in with a good amount of hours. Um, but uh, we do kind of uh, go through that, that program because once you're in the program, you're on a set, uh, kind of a set timeline. Your first semester in the program, you're taking your major courses as well as a practice one course. Second semester is major courses and practice two. Third semester is major courses and practice three. And then your very last semester in the program and last semester at UNT is a full-time uh, practicum. Well, that's all you're doing. It's a basically a full-time internship where you have one course where you come back on campus as well. Uh, so it's kind of equivalent to, to kind of a student teaching where that's pretty much most of what you're doing that last semester is you're out, uh, you're in a placement at the department places you into, um, and you're getting that hands-on experience to get, make you uh, a better, better marketable towards a, a job afterwards or to go towards grad school. Um, so it's all kind of working through that, through that path. Um, I would also kind of mention that uh, if you're interested in social work and you're uh, looking at doing like a master's degree in social work, if you have a bachelor's of social work degree and you're looking at the joint master's program that Dr. Nikki mentioned in the video we watched at the beginning, um, it is possible to finish a master's degree of social work in one year if you have the bachelor's of social work. Um, so kind of a cool, cool function of that there. Great. Thank you, Parker. Um, I would like to address the question about online classes. So um, we have um, two programs that offer 100% online options, and that is our criminal justice degree program, as well as our rehabilitation studies program. Um, every other degree program in HPS does require some face-to-face uh, -face, uh, courses. And this is all in the context of um, pre-COVID um, with that aside, uh, the university has um, adapted to, um, to our current situation and many of our programs uh, this fall and spring are incorporating uh, more online classes as well as um, blended um, or, or remote with some um, you know, Zoom time. Um, and face to face. So it definitely looks a little different this year, but um, you know, uh, in general, we, we do have the, the two programs that are that are, have an option to do 100% online. And I would add to that an option, not a requirement. So those, those, both those programs have in person courses as well as that are that are an option to take. Yeah, absolutely. Um, average, uh, what are the average class sizes for the applied behavior analysis program? Um, I would say I've never seen the classes go over 40. Um, so typically they're around 20 to 30 students, depending on where, where you're at. Uh, early on, you're going to get a little bit more students in the program and those courses. Um, because some of those courses are also core classes for other students. Um, but as you get into the, the more major courses, major specific, uh, it'll be an average of, I think, somewhere around 30, 35 students at most. Um, most courses for behavior analysis are capped at around 40 students, and I've never seen the courses hit capacity in the three years I've been here. So it's, it's typically around that 30 range. Hmm. All right, and as far as, uh, so we have a question of, are there any requirements for public health? Um, so there's not, there are the major requirements. So the way we kind of talked about it earlier, they split up where you have the core requirements, um, the major requirements, and we don't really have any specific college requirements that uh, other colleges may require. Um, so you're gonna be looking at doing your core classes and your major courses and electives to fill in the gap to reach the 120 credit hours that's required. Um, but if you would like to um, email the primary advisor for that, um, I will put that in the chat, her email in the chat as a res or in the Q&A as a response so you can have her email to, to ask her specifically for the uh, courses required for public health. I 
have a, I, I had this question like why would someone choose UNT for public health versus Texas A&M Texas or UT Austin or UNT Dallas? Um, I think that the department does a really wonderful job of answering that question in that video that we posted to our to our YouTube channel. Um, that's um, and I'll I'll give you that uh, that link. Um, I'll give you that link so that you can review that. Um, I think um, I think our program is really phenomenal, and um, I think you should hear directly from the department about uh, about why we think so, and um, you know why you should choose us. Rachel, this is Laura Keys. Yes. I see a question in here about um, nonprofit organizations and um, I'm the undergraduate coordinator for the nonprofit leadership studies program and the urban policy and planning program here at UNT in our College of HPS. And um, the question asks about nonprofit leadership studies and whether we are doing internships and how we're working with the nonprofit community. And I'd love to just uh, provide some um, perspective for students that we are actively engaged with the Dallas, you know, broader DFW uh, nonprofit community. Our students have continued to uh, intern and volunteer in the nonprofit sector, um, you know, mainly virtually at this point with COVID, but we are um, finding uh, opportunities to uh, help, you know, outdoors, working in the community gardens, working with Cube Denton Beautiful. And so we um, actually have an internship coordinator in our program who works directly with students on placement. And so we are gearing up this spring for our internship course. And we have about um, 20 students, 15 to 20 students that'll be taking that course. And we will uh, ensure that all of them have uh, placement in the nonprofit community. Uh, and as Parker was mentioning about the opportunities for service learning or experiential learning, um, we offer that in both the nonprofit leadership studies program and urban policy and planning, where we're actively partnering with um, city governments to do um, uh, different types of, uh, our students are doing a park study right now for the city of Louisville in one of their classes. And then uh, we're working with a nonprofit in our volunteer management class uh, to uh, help them with their volunteer management program. And so we're actively working uh, with the profession to make sure that students uh, get that exposure throughout their degree and feel career ready when they graduate. Thank you, Dr. Keyes. You're welcome, thanks. Yeah, and I'll kind of piggyback off of that as far as just the general um, uh, internship opportunities in general. Um, so a lot of our, a few of our programs do require uh, internships or practicums as part of their, as part of the program. I mentioned social work earlier where that's a requirement for the very last semester. Rehabilitation studies has the same thing where it's a requirement as you're a part of your last course to do a, a, a practicum in the field. Um, other opportunities, I believe audiology, speech, speech language, language pathology, sorry, it's a mouthful. Um, I'll just call, that, call it ASLP. Um, ASLP uh, does have some kind of built in, we're getting the hands-on experience as part of the, the, the curriculum for the major. Um, other programs such as criminal justice um, do also have the opportunity for it, uh, not a requirement, but also but have that opportunity. I, be I believe emergency administration and planning also has the requirement of a, uh, a practicum or internship at the end. Um, so a lot of our programs, if not all of them, if they don't have a requirement of it, they have the option for it. Um, I would say the exception would probably be behavior analysis, um, but that's partially because there is such a close connection with the um, um, the the community. We have the Kristen Farmer Autism Center uh, right uh, right off campus, where it's not a requirement for students to do that as a pra official practicum or internship, but it is an opportunity for students to do that, and they're able to get their RBT or registered behavior technician. Um, while while interning or working there as well. So there's there's a lot of opportunities to do internships for credit or even just do some uh, uh, some service to the, the, the community organizations. I think that was well put in sort of addressing how our how our college um, offers different opportunities 
you know, with each with each of our majors. Um, and like you said, some are required and some are um, our options. And we certainly encourage our students to take that opportunity if, if they can. Um, I, I certainly think it helps prepare students um, you know, better for, for the um, job market and gives you something extra to, to put on your resume. And it really gives you that hands-on experience that connects what you're learning in the classroom with uh, what the job will really look like. Yeah, and even even past the uh, the potential uh, jobs after graduation and such or careers, um, it's also a great benefit if you're looking at grad school. Um, so a lot of grad schools are very competitive, specifically our behavior analysis program and the ASLP program. Both of those both those are very competitive to get into. So it's a lot of times come down comes down to more than just having the courses and the good grades. If you have internships you've done, if you've done uh, worked in research labs on campus with the professors, that makes a huge difference in those who get accepted to the program because they want to have that uh, distinction of what makes you stand out from the other applicants to the program. So, and I mentioned the grad programs a lot uh, because there are, are two fields that it's kind of needed. Um, mm -hmm. So if you're looking at going to audiology and speech language pathology in the state of Texas, you do have to have a graduate degree. Um, which again, that program is very competitive and has a lot of prereqs, which is why the Bachelor's for ASLP is such a great program because it gets you all of those prerequisites you need towards that grad program. Um, same thing for uh, behavior analysis. Um, in order to be a, f a full board certified behavior analysis or BCBA, you have to get a graduate degree. Um, so uh, it's, it's very important that you're making yourself stand out to be able to get into those programs. Um, uh, because a lot of our students in our college will want to go towards those grad programs after graduation, um, but a lot of students from other colleges also want to come to UNC after they finish their bachelor's elsewhere to come to our, towards our grad program. So it's, it's very important and beneficial that you're making yourself known with your faculty members now so you have that connection. Uh, you get good reference letters and stuff to go to, to attend those grad schools if, you, if that's what you're wanting to do. I'll also add the urban policy and planning degree, um, you know, gives gets you a foot in the door to, to begin the to, to be an urban planner. Um, but if you want to work as a city planner, city manager, um, that is going to require um, a master's degree. And we do encourage students check out our master's in public administration um, to to, um, you know, further their career in that direction. Rachel, I would love to just add on to that to say, um, with uh, our Masters of Public Administration that we have a 99% placement and many of our graduates are working here in the DFW region or in the state of Texas. And that's one uh, great opportunity with our undergraduates, both in the nonprofit degree and in the urban policy and planning degree, because we are, for instance, our urban planning program has an urban studio. And that studio is our practicum that you'll do at the end of your, you know, at the, you know, near the completion of your degree. And we're working closely with the cities, um, especially those that are partners with our, us because they're graduates from our program are working in their communities. Um, so you're working on real projects, but we're also helping to introduce you to your career network and, um, making sure that they know who you are and the experience that you're getting. So sometimes we're actively engaged as guest speakers in our, our classes or we're working on, you know, real projects like neighborhood area plans, or as I mentioned, the city of Louisville, uh, the park study that our students have been actively engaged in over the last year. Um, so, and with the nonprofit that is, um, the same with uh, internships and you know helping our graduate network is helping to make internships available for our students and that too is helping connect you to this broader MPA network of students here in the DFW region. Thank you, Dr. Keys. Rachel, I had a question. Yes. I know I told you I wasn't going to be in here, but I was like, this content is too good not to watch. So you, <laughs> it's very fun. <laughs> Um, so a lot of times students, uh, and I'm an admissions counselor, so I, I talk to students all the time. Um, and a lot of students, they ask me when they're, when they're talking about like uh, on-campus involvement, student organizations, that sort of thing, they tend to have this misconception that they are, like student organizations solely equals something like social. The most traditional ones that they'll ask me about are like, what's a Greek life community? Um, or, or like, what's that like at UNT? Or, uh, can I get involved in student government association? And I tell them, absolutely. We've got, you know, all these, we've got 40 different Greek organizations. We have a student government organization, but they are, they comprise 10% of all the different student clubs and activities on campus. 
And I always pushed him, hey, like, you're not just here to, you know, go to school um, and, and to, and to, you know, to learn. You're not just here to also socialize. This is, you need a return on investment, right? College isn't getting any cheaper. And so you want to make sure that you're maximizing the time that you're spending on this campus, not just for, you know, the social engagement and for the academic learning, but also for networking and for preparing, preparing yourself to be a new professional. So could you, uh, could any of you speak to what kinds of student organizations that are specifically tied to, um, to the College of Health and Public Service and more of an academic or professional uh, mindset? Absolutely. I'd be happy to answer that, uh, Winston. Thank you. Um, so each and every one of our nine undergraduate majors has an associated student organization or is in the progress of creating one because they're so new um, that they're just getting getting the, the ball rolling. Um, but like you said, I think it's a it's a it's a really great uh, idea to join one of our academic student organizations that's um, in connection with your degree program, uh, because like you said, it does give you those connections that um, you know, you get to know your faculty better, you get those references, you get to know each other better, um, you're supporting each other. I know one of the, the best examples of this is our um, emergency administration and planning major. Um, they, they call the, the they call the, um, it's like International Association of Emergency Manager Student Chapter. It's quite a, quite a mouthful. They call it IMES for short, and they're just, I just see, you know, they have a group on Facebook and they, you know, post job openings, they really help support each other. Um, they go to, you know, competitions, they, they travel, they go to uh, conferences, um, you know, they, they, um, every year the, the city of Denton hosts a, um, a citywide uh, disaster drill, and they all sign up together and, and participate in that. Um, and, and I see that the students who do that, who are really um, involved in that orga organization, and really any of our, um, you know, student organizations and HPS, they have a leg up. Um, they, they have a better understanding of of the career connection um, and, and certainly have a, a better support system uh, to, to help get them there. And Dr. Keyes, you have, do you want to talk yeah, about some of the ones? To, to share our nonprofit leadership student association is um, two years in the making and uh, they have actively hosted fundraisers. Uh, they have a, a musical fundraiser on campus uh, two, two years ago and raised about $900 for a local charity. Um, they raised $500 last spring doing a fundraiser for children's health and they just recently had a fundraiser, a virtual fundraiser. So they're teaching themselves and they're actively participating in what we're learning in the classroom to, to successfully um, host fundraising activities. And they have uh, organized well around some different volunteer activities because they're all really um, focused on earning the volunteer cord. So they wanna get their 100 hours of volunteer service so they can be recognized at graduation. Uh, and so they are really um, becoming a well-organized uh, organization themselves. And then our urban policy and planning, they started similar to like emergency management through the American Planning Association. They started a student chapter here on campus called, I think it's just American Planning Association Student Org. And they are now one, one year going into their second year. And they have uh, as well raised some, some funds to support their organization, but they bring in guest speakers and they did travel to a conference together um, here in the, uh, we were in Waco the last time together. So they are actively pursuing conference attendance as well. Yeah, and I would kind of add on those. Uh, we do have a couple organizations within our, our major specifically that I know of. Behavior analysis and rehabilitation studies actually have organizations that aren't just student organizations. They're student and alumni and community. Um, so it ties into that, you know, again, it's not just the social side of it. You're also um, being social with people outside of uh, that are working in the field. So you're getting those connections before graduation. So it's just an extra step to making sure that, yes, you're you're connecting with your, your classmates, but you're also connecting with people that are working in the field currently, they're going to be your biggest advocate once you get out of, out of, uh, out of college. Uh, we do have a couple other organizations. Um, there's one I like a lot that is the, uh, uh, through social work, it's, uh, it's called PUSH. It's Persevere Until Success Happens. And it's specifically for students who are coming out of the foster care program. And they're, they're kind of a bridge program to make sure that you're, you're successful when you're starting at UNT. 
Um, and we have a lot of great ones like that. There's a, for, uh, with behavior analysis, one of the, the major focuses of, of that program is working with children with autism, developmental issues, but it's, it's also a large portion of, of, of their faculty actually work with animals. Um, so we do have an organization that's the Organization of Reinforcement of Contingencies with Animals, or called ORCA for short. Um, I had to look it up because I've never heard it actually called the full thing, um, but it is, a, it is getting you connected with those career paths and making sure that you're getting more of that hands-on experience. Um, and that kind of leads into a, a question that we had in the chat, uh, what internships are offered for uh, applied behavior analysis at health and public service. There's not any specific internships that are offered. It's one of those programs that doesn't have required internships, or even any optional ones, um, but it does have these extra opportunities through organizations, both on and off campus to get those experiences, um, but not through college credit. Um, it's just not something that's offered through behavior analysis because there's so many opportunities through the student organizations, through the Kristen Farmer Autism Center, and even so with the other uh, autism centers within the, within the community. All right, y'all, I just wanted to let, uh, for our, all of our guests and our panelists, we have about eight minutes left in this session. So if you guys have, uh, for my uh, guests, if you have any questions you wanna ask our panelists, uh, we still have about eight minutes left in our session. And until you ask questions, I'm gonna keep asking our panelists questions. So um, Dr. Keyes, again, thank you so much for being here. Um, I always like when faculty uh, are like, they participate in our like recruitment events because I can always ask them this question. Everybody in here uh, who's, who's tuned into UNT Preview, they're a prospective student, they're thinking about coming to UNT. And I always like to ask faculty, what are the things that you as the professor are looking for in a new in, in a student like if someone rolls enrolls into your class and if their goal is i want to go to graduate school i want to or i want to have like a really 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 awesome letter of recommendation that i can give in my interview what are the things that equip a student in your classroom uh or i guess what are the characteristics you would you'd be like hmm i am going to take notice of you and i will help you uh what could you speak a little more to that well i uh, great question and um, I think, you know, part of this, I look at it as this, it, this is a team effort and, and all of us want you to be incredibly successful, um, but we need you to also be really willing to kind of roll up your sleeves and kind of be engaged and to come to the class and be ready and prepared. I know it's not always easy to have all the reading and the work done ahead of time, but, you know, give it a good skim and we'll be able to talk. Um, but be engaged, be participating in the class. This, what I try to explain to students is this is your network. Look around the room. The, the people here are, are the people that you're probably going to be working with out in the real world. And so, you know, we kind of have to work together to create an environment where we feel comfortable talking with each other, where we call each other, you know, we, we use our names that we um, uh, express, um, you know, a real interest in each other's, um, you know, what they're bringing to the table. And so engaging in the classroom is one way to definitely get the attention of the instructor in the class because they're excited. They want you to, to want to learn the material. Um, and the other that I just, you know, always highly recommend is taking that time to visit your professor or your faculty members in office hours. Um, we always have to have office hours and we're usually sitting there just waiting for you to show up because we <laughs> want to engage with you in that way. And that does give you an opportunity. I mean, it's an open invitation to meet with your faculty on a weekly basis. And it gives your faculty an opportunity to get to know you and to learn more about, you know, what's, you know, what are your drives and ambitions. Um, and I, I, I'm sure when you go to class that that kind of information, they'll take heart to that information and tailor conversations about those things that interest you. You know, the more your faculty knows about um, the things that really drive you, the more they're going to want to tailor the, the way the material um, is presented so it's exciting for you. So that, that just, it's part of the process. And I think it just really helps to create for a really um, fun and stimulating environment when everyone's ready to kind of get in the classroom and, and participate. Thank you, Dr. Keyes. 
Erica, do you have an announcement for us? <laughs> we do have five more minutes left of this session, so I wanted to just give you all a warning. We will end this recording in about four minutes. So if we do have last minute questions, I will probably go ahead and get those into the Q&A feature. And while we're waiting for you to ask your final questions, um, for my academic advisors who are in the room, any new student, they come to UNT and what, you know, if we're lucky, they've come to, you know, they have family or somebody who's been here before, or at least they've like taken a tour of campus. But if they're like me, your first day, of, your first day on campus is orientation. Right? So if you had to give any new student to UNT, like an advisor's like, Here's like the here's here's the hack to like being successful. Uh, not that there is a single hack <laughs> to being successful in college, but as academic advisors, what's one one piece of advice you would give to any new student at UNT? Don't be afraid to ask for help. Uh, if you if you don't like like spend time thinking about what questions to ask. Always have questions to ask. Ask tons of questions. It doesn't mean you're stupid. It means you're learning. You're here to learn. Um, so. So bring those questions to your advisors, to your faculty, to your, you know, your, your, your other students that you're working with. Um, be curious, right? And be engaged. Like, and, and that ties in with Dr. what Dr. Keyes was saying too. Um, ask questions. Yeah. And I, I, my quick thing would be uh, get lost. Um, either literally or metaphorically on campus and exploring things. Um, you'll never know what, what, what you'll find on campus or you'll find in student organizations or with a faculty member. Don't be afraid to get lost and put yourself out there to, to make sure you're exploring things. And it's just kind of a, a way to make sure you're, you're learning things. And uh, with that, kind of always, always meet with us. Uh, as your advisor, we are kind of, I always say we're a resource of resources. We ah. may not know the answer to something, but we know who does. So if we can't solve it, we can get you connected with the people who can. So no matter what it is, please check with us and we can get you and connect with the right people. Whether it's academics or not, we, we know, uh, for instance, I went to grad school here. I worked with uh, different student organizations as a grad student. Uh, Rachel, Rachel went to, to college here. So she's she's been through all of it. Um, uh, most of our advisors have been to UNT in school in some fashion. <laughs> so uh, we, we know campus and, and, and anything on it, basically. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm an alumni of UNT as well. Uh, I am an, I'm an alumni of the College of Health and Public Service. Um, and, and this is such a, I just feel like I belong here. And I hope that you all uh, feel the same. I think that the culture that we've created as a college is really welcoming and caring. And, um, you know, we're here to lift you up. I've heard numerous times that, that we're the most supportive uh, and helpful advising office on campus. Um, I, I couldn't disagree. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, um, we're, we're just here to help you. And, and I hope that, that you join us at UNT. And I hope that you feel like this is a place where you belong as well. A couple last minute questions. Uh, does, uh, for public health, is there an included uh, internship or field work? I don't believe there's an included required internship, um, but I believe there's opportunities to get that involvement outside of it. Um, and I don't know the public health faculty to student ratio. Rachel, would you happen to have seen that? I don't, I'm sorry. <clears throat> um, again, the primary advisor for that, uh, Azama Alia, would be a great resource to kind of answer answer those questions. And I'll, I'll put her email and the responses for that. Excellent. Yeah, well, Rachel, Rachel, Parker Ellis, Dr. Keys, Xavier, Amanda, thank you guys so, so much. And Erica, of course. Uh, thank you guys so much for helping make this preview uh, a very successful event for our guests. Uh, we look forward to answering your questions in the future. Um, so please do not have, again, like Rachel said, when you need help, any question at all, you're learning. You're not, it's not a dumb question. So please ask your questions. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you guys at the rest of your preview day. Thank you so much. Go Mean Green. Go Mean Green. <laughs>